which means hello and welcome to the Abenaki homeland and to the Maritime Museum where we're having the uh, Abenaki Heritage Weekend. Huh. Thank you so much for that beautiful welcoming song and uh, Chief Roger Longtoshian, it's really an honor to be here today with you and, and your colleagues. Um, tell us a little bit about the display that is in front of you, and I know some of the work is actually your own craftsmanship. Yep. Um, most of the stuff that's here on the table um, is either made by me, my wife, sometimes my son makes stuff, uh, or other Abenaki members of our tribes, of uh, different tribes. Um, like the quill work here was made by Jim Taylor, uh, who's an excellent quill worker, and he does wampum beads and wampum jewelry. Um, and then, you know, it, here's something that's actually not made by an Abenaki person, and it's a twine bag, and it's made by uh, Julia Martin, who's uh, Quina Wampanoag. But she lives up in Vermont, and uh, she's, she does beautiful twine work like this and stuff. Um, Sash, my wife, made bowls that uh, Walker Brooks, uh, Monroe Brook made for us and stuff. So pretty much everything here, we somebody in a tribe has made, um, or you know, or from one of the other tribes, Abenaki tribes. Um, and that's, we're kind of here to try and teach some of the old culture. There's people here that are teaching newer stuff. Um, there's people making baskets and you know, doing some singing and all sorts of crafts are going on. Mm -hmm. um, we kind of move this into inside because of the, the wet weather. Normally we have a, a, a canvas lean-to set up outside where we normally set up and do our talks and demonstrations and things, have a fire cooking food. But uh, we know it's gonna be a very wet weekend, so we decided to move into the roost here mm -hmm. and uh, kind of roost ourselves. So. Is there a certain period of time um, today that your regalia represents? Yeah, um, the time period that we're, we're portraying here of our ancestors and, and people that would have been working with us, um, like Snapper is over here in the corner, and you'll probably talk to him in a little bit, but he's here as a French trader who would have come down and traded things and explaining the... Um, the, the wares that he would have had and the history behind that stuff and how it kind of intermeshed and interwebbed with the, the Abenaki people. Um, this is time period is approximately 1750s. Um, we have in the past here for the quad centennial, we had been doing 1609. So the clothing is, is much different than it was when, you know years back when we were doing the 1609 uh, events here. A lot more European uh, clothing, shirts made of linen, um, sometimes cotton. Even even our leggings and things are made of wool. Um, not to say they had to been. They could have been made of, of buckskin too. Um, but a lot of people went over to wearing wool leggings and wool blankets mm -hmm. and stuff. That would have been considered a trading item? Mm -hmm. That would have been something that we here the native people would not have been able to make and it was shipped probably from Europe uh, sometimes things like vermilion were shipped from as far away as China because vermilion is made from mercury and sulfur and China seems to have large deposits I guess you would call them deposits or pools of mercury and um, not very good stuff for you to probably be wearing but the brilliant red that comes from vermilion was was highly sought by many uh, Eastern Native people in the past. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I know you, you do a lot of also living history, um, and then that kind of is what your exhibit could be yes. uh, considered today. Um, can you talk about the importance of just in general the public recognizing um, the, the living history of the Abenaki Nation? Yeah, you know, there's a common saying, you can't really go forward without knowing your past. And that's kind of the premise of what we're, we're working on here. Um, there are many people who are doing modern native things, modern Abenaki things. Um, I've always had a, a, a deep interest in history. And so, you know, I've done some stuff that's gone back to pre-contact. Um, so I do different time periods of... Uh, of history and some people call them reenactments. I, for us, we just we prefer calling them living history um, or uh, experimental archaeology. Some people might call it because you know I'm I'm getting older and, and less run, being able to run around in the woods like I used to, but going out in the woods and actually living in the clothing, bringing the type of food that they had. Um, living out under a lean-to for a week or so at a time uh, teaches you a lot of things, you know, starting your fire with flint and steel every day. Um, you know, sometimes it don't light so easily and you get wet and cold. Uh, so that's, that's also part of the living history. Um, don't do that as much as I used to. Uh, jokingly, uh, we're starting to call ourselves uh, Ford Indians because, uh, which is, you know, it was considered kind of a derogatory term, but it was natives who hung around the fort. Um, and being that we have an actual fort that we do hang around in over in uh, Charlestown, New Hampshire, Fort Four, which was again, um, the reason we're there is, is there was a whole lot of history dealing with the Abenaki people there. Um, if they weren't outside trying to burn the place down during times of peace, they were inside trading with the local trader, his name was Phineas Stevens. And again, that's Snapper, you know, he, he normally will set up a whole trading store there and talk about all this stuff and the, you know, why the natives were there, what they were trading for, the different things and how they were being used. And that's exactly what we do. So yeah, so going indoors now and having a, a nice fireplace and tables and things to sit down on and, and talk to people as they come through, is it's nice. Mm -hmm. So, like today, you know, this may not be the most historically accurate building for doing a 1750s uh, living history talk and, and, you know, what we're doing right now is, but it's better than sitting in the rain and, and trying to talk to people who are coming through, getting soaking wet and stuff. Mm -hmm. so. In all your years of doing uh, living history, are you finding that the, in general, the public is more educated or they're more interested in, in maybe the details? Um, I'm thinking of how people might think about even uh, moving forward in time, like eugenics and, and, and some of the other factors and um, genocides and you know survival that the people have Gone through. Know, gone through. Um, it, it depends on who, where and who you're talking with. Um, some people you get are very up to date on everything, and you know, and they're they're all into things and learning about all stuff. And you get other folks that really, you know, they're actually like you're opening their eyes, and they're just mm -hmm. like, "Wow, I didn't know that happened," you know. Um, and that's kind of what we're here for. And again, like an event like this. We have different sections. People are doing different things. Mm -hmm. You know, we have folks that are doing, you know, in pit cooking. Um, you know, people will be singing, uh, dressed in, well, modern native clothing. Mm -hmm. I say modern native clothing. That's clothing that people wear today when they go to powwows or maybe, you know, some sort of native gathering. Um, again, our culture is not static. It's, it's, it's not in a vacuum, it's fluid, and it's been changing forever. I mean, you know, what our people looked like and did maybe 10,000 years ago, 
because this would have been a very frozen place, and we know they were here. They were in northern Vermont. We have the archaeological evidence. Um, you know, uh, the archaeologists, anthropologists, the science-type people, for a long time, just didn't think we had the intelligence to make boats of some sorts, probably skin boats kind of similar to what the Inuit you know, are still doing today um, and living in Arctic conditions. Um, but the archaeological evidence is there. Um, so we changed. You know, was, we went from being hunter-gatherer people to at least a thousand years ago because we know from, again, archaeological sites uh, over in the Connecticut River Valley where they have found corn, beans, squash, and even tobacco seeds. So we know that our people at least a thousand years ago in the Connecticut Valley were farming, maybe longer. You know, uh, Again, the, as archaeology goes along, certain people might find you know, a site, they might find something that goes a little further back. Um, so, you know, so we changed now, you know, now we're, people are wearing, well, glass beads and, and jewelry and, and in some cases people are actually just going, starting to, you start seeing at the powwows, people are actually sliding back and dressing in earlier clothing as part of their traditional culture. I mean, so when people say uh, traditions and I'm wearing my traditional clothing, it all depends at what time in your evolution of your, of your, of your people. You know, there's a lot of different styles of clothing. Yeah. Um, I, I've heard it called uh, living culture. Yeah. And, and, and that is like some, uh, something that um, instead of like uh, emphasizing colonization or decolonization to actually maybe emphasize a little bit more of the living culture yeah. of, of the nation, of the people. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's so everybody's got their their little nook or corner on what they're doing yeah. and I mean that's what I think makes the celebration here good yeah. and, and, and a, a neat thing is that you know we've got history older history yeah. we've got new history and hopefully we're seeing stuff that's going to happen in the future yeah that's you know, very so. exciting thank you so much for sharing with us a little bit this morning and um, maybe some of your colleagues might you're welcome we'll talk all right. Quickly, my name is Snapper. Um, I actually have become accepted as a friend of the El Nu tribe, so I, I'm very honored to be here. I work um, at a college, but history has always been one of my big interests. And so when I had the opportunity to get involved in living history and, and work with Roger, it was something I accepted um, pretty easily. And he jokes about, you know, by the change of the hat, I can be, I can be Dutch, I can be English, I can be French. But today I'm portraying a French person. Um, the French were uh, allied with the Abenaki people. And um, so consequently, as a trader, a fur trader, these are the, all the things that are in front of me, are the kinds of items that I would bring down, maybe from Montreal, Quebec. Um, and they'd come down by boat through the lakes and we would be able to meet at you know locations and trade these items out. I'm trying to get furs. This is a beaver pelt. I've got otter, but all fur has got value of some kind. And these are the kinds of goods that they're not able to make themselves, but at this point in time, 1750s, are well documented as being part of their native communities. So brass kettles, which replaced pottery, um, French pottery, which is uh, something that was very, very much accepted, nice colorful greenware. I've got wool blankets, I've got wool toques, um, I've got wool just material. The blanket could have been made into, a, into a garments, but they could just have the blanket as a blanket and get material as well. I've got axes, I've got hoe blades. Hose blades typically were made by deer scapulas, the shoulder blade of a deer. So having that metal hoe blade is something that can be resharpened and used over and over again. The knives, um, spear points, ice chisels. These right here are called beaver darts. They were actually used quite a bit with ice fishing um, because there's a little hole right here in the dart. And what would happen is you'd have a line attached to that and you would spear the fish through the hole and like a harpoon, this would be attached to the fish and could go off 
and then you could pull it back with the line that was attached to that hole. Um, so these are just kind of a, a good representation of things that would be traded back and forth. Um, one thing that is different when the French people are dealing with the Abenaki people versus the English or the Dutch is we're much more thinking of this as a gift exchange, friends, we're family. I mean, French did intermarry in quite a bit. So one of the things we'll do is instead of just, this is a business transaction, we're gonna start first with an exchange of gifts. So one of the things, two things I have down here that are a bit different, I have a bowl of tobacco to offer for the men so that they can have a smoke. And I have uh, thimbles and bells for the women. And most people don't under, they, the tobacco concept they get, you know, put it in your pipe and, and, you, and you have a smoke. But the thimbles and the bells are something that kind of confuses people. Um, they think of thimbles strictly for sewing. In this case, what happened would be with the thimble, you could puncture it and then string some deerskin, a leather thong through there. And then this would be sewn to the dance garters. So between the bells and the cymbal, cymbals, when you danced, you had that nice little bell-like ring. Prior to that, deer toes would have been used in place of it. So, um, and as far as like my personal dress, very much at this point a native influence. Um, I'm wearing leggings, I've got a breech clout, I've got a shirt, I've got a sash. I'm not wearing moccasins, but traditionally I'd have what are called souillets, souillet de bouffes, uh, an oxhide shoe, but it's based upon a moccasin sort of design. And so we, as the French know, we don't know this land, we don't know this territory. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna be smart and learn from the people who have accepted us, in this case, the, the native people, and we're gonna adapt our dress to their way of, of being. So at this point, we're a blend of, of each other's culture. We take our example of clothing items from them and they go with the materials kind of from us. So it's a blending of, of things over the years. That's terrific. Thank you so much for that. Well, and <laughs>
And maybe we could start with uh, some of those influences and how does that get started? Um, good question, actually. <laughs> um, well, first of all, I was an artist before, but I, I never really found a focus. Most artists have a style or a subject matter that they're noted for, and I, I did not. Um, but when I decided to dedicate my work to tribal art, I found that focus, and um, part, of, part of it is the stories. <laughs> okay, guys. <laughs> um, the uh, I like doing the uh, designs, but I had to research them because I wasn't raised with my culture. And unfortunately, there's a whole lot that's been lost. So when I was researching and I wanted to make it Abenaki, I couldn't make it specifically Abenaki. I had to include the other members of the Wabanaki Confederacy um, who had things very much like our own. Um, it's, in my research, I discovered that the generations that were um, denied their language, uh, children being taken away and sterilizations happening, it became a, a defensive mode to not tell children the stories or to tell them about the culture or to, to raise them with the culture, even though certain things were, um, you know, the way you do things is, are just sometimes a cultural thing, uh, like fishing and, and planting. Um, a lot of people continue to do those things in the Abenaki way. But uh, they did not want their children to stand out as native, unfortunately. So a lot got lost. And by the time Frank Speck uh, came in as the first uh, anthropologist to do uh, research in the field, a lot had been lost. And what was left, some people didn't want to share. <laughs> uh, because, uh, again, it, it was not something people wanted to uh, think about because of all the hurt that had gone on uh, in the past. For myself, um, I always knew I was Indian. I was not raised with it. Uh, my parents went their separate ways when I was fairly young. So I was raised by my mother, who was German. She always told me I was native, but I wasn't supposed to talk about it. And if I saw my father's family, I was to lower my eyes and cross the street and not talk to them. So I had nothing to tell me what Indian was, except the movies. And of course, we know those are not very accurate, but there was always a part of me that was very different from my sister and my mother. My sister's my half-sister. And I was the odd man out. I'm like every kid, you know, you think you're, you've uh, been adopted or something because you're different. But I wasn't. Uh, I was just different because of my dad. And um, his heritage came down from Canada. His parents lived as proper French family educated, and the father was educated, not, not the mother. And um, they didn't talk about it much. But I have a photograph that I swear all, all the grandmother needs is a, a, cor a, a corn cob pipe. <laughs> and that would be great, because she really looked the part of being the little Indian woman in her rocking chair. But. Um, that was the thing, you, you tried to pass, but it, I, it was no coincidence that they found each other, because when, when the father came down from Canada and met her in Haverhill, I think it is, Massachusetts, um, priests were sending people down and putting them in communities of like culture. And when I did the genealogy, I found Indian on both sides of, the, of his parents. So 
at various times in history, people were not allowed to marry without telling their partner prior to marriage that they were native. My, my dad had to do that for my mom. She told me that he told her about it. Um, but in these communities, because they all knew each other and knew their, their heritage, they didn't have to speak of it. They just selected spouses uh, from within the community. So it was kind of interesting to, uh, to realize that. Um, today there are only two uh, Abenaki reservations, both in Canada. Uh, Odenak and Biencor, we have no reservations in the United States. And it, it, it's not something that we really are looking at. We're certainly not looking at casinos or anything along that line. Um, we are building a community. Uh, I'm very, very proud of what our chief, Don Stevens, is doing. Uh, we have now got a, a cultural center, and I'm looking forward to uh, contributing to that. He's finding uh, uh, means in the airport to have Abenaki items displayed so that when people are coming on and off planes, they will see uh, the heritage and know we're still here. Um, I decided to dedicate my artwork to tribal uh, work because every time I picked up a book about woodland natives, we weren't there. We aren't there. Very, very little about Abenaki. And very often it's labeled Wabanaki. So it's not specific. And so I'm hoping that my work, along with other tribal artists, will correct that and put us into uh, uh, some of these books. Um, I did a book uh, on our designs. Um, had really intended to start out and make a book. I was doing the research for myself. And as we got recognized, a publisher approached Vera uh, Longto, uh, she in, and asked if they knew any Abenaki authors. And she knew what I was working on, and we went from there, and the book became a book. <laughs> I was thinking I was going to put it into a notebook and give it to Chief to put on the shelf somewhere, but it turned into a real book. Not a hot seller, but a, a book. <laughs> and um, I'm very grateful about that. I also go out and do genealogy talks. And Today was a very exciting day because I did the talks in Tallinn, Connecticut and other places, but this particular gentleman walked up to me and he said, I recognize you. And I said, yeah, you look familiar. Where do I know you from? And he said, I went to your genealogy uh, talk in Tallinn at the French Genealogy Library, and I'm now part of the Nulhagen Band. And I was like, yes! <laughs> Someone actually followed through and was successful because so many natives um, are their their tribal roles are closed or treaties say they can't accept the out of blood quantum. Um, we do it by relationship. And even though we have different bands, <laughs> we're all related <laughs> one way or another. We, you'll see somebody go around and say, that's my cousin. Well, they might be from the Missisquoi, and the, and the other person is, is Nelhegan. We're still Abnaki, and uh, we consider each other sisters and brothers, so, or cousins. Um, but it's really interesting that uh, right now they're doing some work to build a um, core tree, I guess you would call it, and that is looking for early families uh, and seeing where they branch off to. And this is great. I'm finding out I have some more Abenakis that I escaped me from uh, when I was doing my research. I really thought they were French. 
I didn't go far enough in my own research. Uh, so I have some more Abenaki in there. Uh, and uh, it's interesting how many of us share certain ancestors. So this this making of a core tree is, is going to be a really, really good thing. Uh, I know the Missisquoi were trying to do that years ago. I don't know if they ever pursued it. But, uh, if you get back to the most earliest families you can and then follow those, how they leaf out, then, uh, then you can see how we're all related. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I, on the French side, uh, there were 15 settlers who came into Quebec, Montreal, and I was related to over half of them. <laughs> you know, it was really cool. I'm like, I'm early, early on everybody's side. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's terrific. Well, we have so much to learn from uh, the work that you've done, and to visually see uh, the stories come alive in, in your artwork is so beautiful, Jeannie. It's uh, really wonderful to, to see it here on Heritage Weekend. Um, is there anything else you'd like our viewers to know about genealogy and how that really shapes um, your walk through life as it affirms who you are again and again. Um, a good example is, like I said, my sister and I are half-sisters. We never think of it that way because there's just the two of us. But she never got to follow up on her dad. And I think uh, mom and he split when she was around five or six. And while she has some memories, uh, there aren't that many that are accurate, unfortunately, whether he didn't tell my sister, my mom all the truth, or my mom got it confused, or my sister got it confused, I don't know. But I've taken on trying to do his genealogy to try to give her some peace of mind, because the difference between us is I've been very successful because I am rooted. And my sister and her family have health problems. Um, a lot of depression, uh, and I think it comes out of that mysteriousness, uh, lack of rootedness, um, and I've seen this in other people. When I when I saw what was happening with uh, immigration uh, with very young children, I, I became horrified. I was very sick when after my daughter's birth, I had to be away for a very long time. And my daughter was a newborn, and my son was three years old. And it's been a very long time for them to get their feet under them. So yeah, having roots, having good beginnings, and having good roots uh, makes a huge difference in a person's life. Yeah, I, I really believe that. And, and I'll, I'll take this opportunity because, it, again, uh, our, our current administration is, is um, attempting to uh, designate all Indians as a race as opposed to a culture and society and sovereign nations. And I hope that does not happen. It means a loss of land for those who have reservations. It means uh, a loss. Of, uh, I know you people think that you probably continue the culture, but that's like saying people in America who are from Italy or Spain or whatever can consider can continue their culture. They can only do it to a point. Uh, I mean, we've lost a lot because we've lost our land, and we're very, very connected to the land and water and air, but. To lose our designation as people, uh, it's a nightmare. Uh, the thought of it is an utter nightmare. And it would mean uh, people will say, oh, well, you know, well, no, because the lands will be sold, so they will not be recoverable. Any uh, mining or, or uh, 
other resources that are taken from the land can never be put back. And all of this is a disturbance. Uh, we're, seeing, we're seeing fish dying, birds dying. Uh, we're seeing land being contaminated so it can't be used for grazing or for food planting. And at what point are we going to realize we're not going to be able to feed ourselves? <laughs> We have companies like Nestle buying up water and reselling it to the people they got to get from. Uh, I saw a science fiction movie where this happened, and I thought, really? Well, not science fiction anymore. It's happening. Uh, so many places have contaminated water, not even suitable for taking a bath or, or doing laundry. Uh, when we say the earth is our mother, think about what a good mother does. She takes care of you. She nourishes you. She keeps you warm. She keeps you sheltered. And that's what Mother Earth does. A sign here that tells about your dad and that character, that raccoon character. Could you tell us about that raccoon and what, what is his Abnaki name? The raccoon's Abnaki name is Aspan and he's a big trickster. He tricks all the other animals. My favorite chapter is chapter three. Well, why is that your favorite? To me, it just seems like it's the most funny. What, what is chapter three about? The title of chapter three is Asbin's Honey Dance, where he tricks Awasus the bear. It's one of the funniest pranks he does. <laughs> he tricks a bear. <laughs> that does sound funny. No, no, that's not. Sure, sure. Uh, my name is Brian Shedebert. I am a member of the Nohegan Abenaki tribe. Um, what you've seen and what my son Nathan has talked about is my first book, uh, Asman's Great Journey. And that is a story of Asban the raccoon, who is, like he eloquently put, our trickster. Um, and he travels up and down the Connecticut River, playing pranks on all the an other animals, and vice versa. Um, became a storyteller just, I guess, by nature of being a father, and passing those stories on to my children, who I had learned from my father. Um, and my children, I have two other daughters who aren't here today, uh, they're the ones who actually talked me into putting those stories into a book format <laughs> so that they could be shared with others. Um, and I'm currently, I just finished my second book, which hopefully will be um, published by the end of the summer, uh, which is the um, origin story of lacrosse for New England, all of us New England tribes, mostly the Abenaki, and how the game came to be and its importance to us. Oh, that sounds so fascinating. Good for you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Can't wait to see. Um, talk to you more about that when we, when we definitely when it's published. Yeah, I was yeah. hoping to have some here today, but they get some author copies available, but they weren't able to print them in time. It's yeah. kind of a last minute. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have any other intertribal activities that you're doing this summer? I know you like to do canoeing and and uh, other yep. activities like that. Yes, yeah, so we I know two that I'll be involved in is uh, we'll be canoeing the Connecticut River again uh, at some point this summer. And then also in October every year is the um, Deer Island Memorial Paddle, which is a, a canoe journey from Deer Island in Boston Harbor uh, into Natick, Massachusetts, which is a reverse of the um, path when the Nipmuc were rounded up and sent to Deer Island, uh, basically almost as an internment camp um, during the King Philip's War. So it's a memorial to remember them and it's basically bringing them home, coming from the island back to Natick. And you'll be... I'll be paddling is that as well. Yep. That's an interesting one because it's in the open ocean. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little more... In October. A little more, and it's in October where it's usually rainy. 
Yeah. So. Now, do the youth participate as well? Uh, not in that one, just because of the risk with being in the open ocean. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of youth back when we get back. There's a big potluck and gathering and storytelling, so they're usually there. But usually, yeah. the youth are involved in the Connecticut River paddle, but not in the the open ocean. Oh. That sounds so exciting. Thank you for sharing you. about those events. And, sure, thank you. Thank um, you for giving us a voice. Yeah, have a, have a wonderful time. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Amy Cooktarian, and I'm part of the Kawasaki the Koas Abenaki tribe. And I do contemporary painting. Um, I do watercolor paintings um, with some pen and ink work. And I see that you've been doing a lot of birch trees and kind of almost like a study of the birch and the birch bark. Could you tell what the significance of the, the birch tree <clears throat> might be to you as an indigenous woman? So I have an obsession with birch trees and dead beech leaves. <laughs> and um, it's just because every single one is different. Um, and I just love that each one has a personality and um, especially in the winter time when they just are standing alone and just surrounded by white but then you know the blue of the sky and then a, the pop of you know their bark and like the peach tones that they get um, so I'm just really drawn to it and they're just they're so peaceful um, and of course um, being native birch is used for many different things from making baskets to making canoes um, even the, if you find the bark on the ground it's perfect for starting fires and you know so it's just it's a really it's a really great uh, tree to have around and I'm just I, I like to go out and explore and paint what I'm seeing at the time so if it's um, if I see all this white from winter and then I come upon a beech tree um, with the leaves still clinging you know it's just it's they're so beautiful and so I have to paint them um, to capture them and so and I do that with anything anything can capture my attention um, and especially if they have little imperfections those are always my favorite so I'm right now I'm following the season so I'm really excited for fall this year because I, I really have some fun ideas that I want to do and hopefully get some different colors so, Amy, tell us where people can find you if they're interested in seeing more of your art. So, I am on Facebook. Um, you can look me up at Amy Hooktarian Watercolor Artist, and I also have an Instagram. It's um, Hooktarian Art, and then I am also at a couple different galleries um, around the state. So, I'm at Creative Space Gallery in Virgins. I am in um, Artisans Gallery in Waitsfield, and at Rock Art Brewery in. Um, um, in Morrisville. All right. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. What's up, buddy? Okay, well, how do you gain it? Look wise. Be consistent. Oh, that's later. <laughs> yeah, no, we got special tools. I mean, you can just sort of split it down. Whatever you are going to pass. But what makes this super special, because, I mean, you can pound rings off of lots of different trees. He's making a wooden ribbon. Okay. How old were you when you took an interest in this? Uh, five years ago. <laughs> and that was just weaving the baskets. We did a three-year apprenticeship with master basket maker Jeannie Brink, who also happens to be a cousin. There you go. Yeah, it worked out nice. We got a grant from the Vermont Folklife Center to uh, study under her. And that covered materials and teacher's fees. And from there, that was uh, right around the time when the Emerald Ash Borer was really... Yep. I mean, pretty much the end game in most of the states that produced a lot of the Spence commercials in Michigan, here now. Wisconsin, now starting here. So we couldn't find it anywhere. And so uh, we had to go and get it ourselves. And that really got me into the materials preparation end of things. Which, thank goodness, because, uh, you know, spending $3 for linear foot of this stuff is just not, wow. not fun. All right. Look at that. That is just pretty. Right. And this is what we weave with. It is flexible, it's shiny, it's beautiful. You can strip it down to the right width. Really easy. Thank you. Wow. 
And now you've seen the wooden ribbon. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> was this harvested in Thetford? Awesome. This was harvested in Thetford. All right. Yes. I knew you were there. Yeah. Cool. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's super flexible. Don't try to break it. Harry, this looks like a, a some sweetgrass basketry here. That is some sweetgrass basketry. Wow. Can you tell us about it? Certainly. I think you know how we get to the splint. So what I'm doing right now is actually Aaron has pounded and gotten it ready and I'm shaving it down and smoothing it out and I've already gauged it with so we have different size gauges that are different widths and so we run the splint once it's been off the log and we run it down the gauge and it gives us the width that we want so when we make a basket we have some symmetry symmetry between the different splints and it can help it come up so that it doesn't end up being high on one side and low on another. And then we use the splint for the upright. I don't know, this is one that I'm just beginning here. So we've made the base and then we use the splints for the upright and then you can either use the splints for a round like this basket shows or you can use sweet grass and use that to weave with and it just has a different look it's so beautiful it's uh, it's got a I don't know. There's a neat sheen to it, and it's very beautiful. Yeah, and the patterns are just a little bit different. They it looks are. finer, and so you can see the top of this. We use sweet grass to get started on the top. Oh yeah, which is also on the top of the bells that are here. And unfortunately, over time, the green does turn to a brown, but it tends to keep a little bit of the sheen. And if you spritz it with a really light mist a couple times a year, it will also keep that wonderful sweet smell mm -hmm. that we've all come to love with sweet grass. Mm. Does it have personal significance to you as a woman, an indigenous woman, well, the sweetgrass? It certainly does. Sweetgrass is considered um, the hair of Mother Earth and it is very important in our culture. Um, and for me to be able to use both the ash also has significance because that is part of our creation story as well. Um, Guscabi shot an arrow into an ash tree and out of it came white and brown and red and yellow people. Um, so to be able able to make something um, out of a, out of living beings and then make it into something new that can be used and treasured for a long time to come. Um, it has special meaning. It connects me to my roots and also because this is how my ancestors made a living. Um, both recently and in the distant past, it is able to kind of connect me to them and I feel complete when I'm working on baskets. So it, it's been wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you, you finished your apprenticeship with your cousin Jeannie. We did, Brent. yeah. So Aaron and I were fortunate me to do a three-year apprenticeship with Jeannie, who's a master basket maker. And we were, I think, um, put up to her 25th uh, apprentice. So she has taught 25 Abnakis over the last probably 15 to 20 years how to make baskets, which is just amazing. Because when she first learned, she had to go to Odenac. There was no one in Vermont that we know of that were making traditional Abnaki baskets. So it's quite a legacy that she's been able to leave um, and that we hope to carry on. Yes. And it was quite an honoring at Middlebury College recently. You attended that um, honoring for Jeannie. That was, just tell us a little bit about yeah. it. So that was just absolutely wonderful and I and something certainly well deserved for Jeannie. Middlebury College um, honored her with an honorary doctorate of the arts um, at their graduation ceremony on um, Memorial Day weekend. And it was just wonderful because what they were really honoring was her impact um, for the Vermont communities and helping people recognize that the Abenaki people are still alive and well and integrated in the community and her work that she's really done over the last 20 to 40 years um, sharing the history, helping us understand not only basketry and the native crafts, but um, the history of the people, the history of colonialism and the impact that had on the indigenous populations, 
Um, and that really people, I think, like Jeannie and her generation planted the seeds so that my generation and my son's generation can be able to really kind of reclaim our heritage and our culture, continue learning more about it. Um, and share that now with the community at large. Um, and when Jeannie started her education and process, that was at a time that many of the Abenaki were still underground um, because of the difficult history that we had in the early 1900s. So I really feel that, that she laid that foundation so that we can be here today um, having Abenaki Heritage Days. Um, and we have more and more people coming every single year who are Abenaki and are kind of recognizing they want to learn and grow and reclaim that heritage so that it's not lost. Beautiful. It's such a beautiful story, um, and I really appreciate the different shapes that you keep coming up with. Uh, some of them look modern, some of them are very traditional in their shapes, and uh, so good for you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else you would like our viewers to know about your work, your business name, and where they can reach you? Um, you certainly, I do have an Etsy account, but I don't have a whole lot on it because I'm really finding that because baskets are really personal, that it does better if I make to order and I can really talk with people and get a sense of what it is that they're looking for. Do they want the traditional? Do they want a utilitarian basket? So I'm, I'm really kind of going more and more make to order uh -huh. versus um, just out there. Um, but anyone can reach me at my email address, um, which is krwood at gmail, krwoodvermont at gmail.com. <laughs> um, and I'm also on Facebook, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Hi, I'm Diane Stevens. I'm a photographer, um, obviously. Um, I'm with the Nohegan Tribe, and this is my artwork from all different areas, from Africa, from Peru, from, from all over Vermont, New England, Florida, uh, Carolinas. Um, so I hope you enjoy the picture. I hope you'll come to the show and enjoy it. Um, you can also find my pictures at www.dianestevensphotography.com. It will take you to the website. Shell. 
and you can do all kinds of amazing things with it and this is very important to me. Um, when you find a shell this color, which is amazing because normally you would find white with a little bit of purple. When you find a shell like this, this is my gold, my diamonds. That's what I tell everybody. <laughs> and it's amazing. Just natural like this. It's amazing. So, I love it. And so, I do different kinds of designs underwater. Um, otherwise, it cracks and shatters. For example, my owl. And then I do real quahog shell wampum. But I'm not really good at it yet, but I'm getting there. So that would be you make the bead, each wampum bead separately? Yes. Pretty cool. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing.